Hello, this is Angela with Park Rose Permaculture. I'm super excited to make today's video. It is a request from Phytomimetics and I will link to them down below. So first off, I just got out of a neurology appointment where I got a bajillion shots of Botox for my hemiplegic migraines. I do that every 12 weeks. So if I look like a human pincushion, that's why. Um, I will say that that there is nothing else that has improved my quality of life more than getting Botox for my migraines. So um, fabulous, amazing treatment. Thank you, Kaiser, for covering it. Okay, so today I want to talk about a meme that Phytomimetic shared and tagged me and asked me to cover it. And if you don't know who Phytomimetics is, they're a page on Facebook that makes the most hilarious and shares the most hilarious plant memes. Um, okay, so they posted a meme that was about plant guilds, about fruit tree guilds, and tagged me because fruit tree guilds are kind of my jam. I love growing fruit trees and guilds are kind of a core tenant in permaculture. In fact, I have a ton of videos on fruit tree guilds because I get so many requests to talk about what it is that I plant in my tree guilds. So before we dive into this meme of like, are fruit tree guilds, are they like, mm, are they pseudoscience garbage or are they really useful and evidence-based? Let's talk about what a guild is and then we'll dive into that, that question. In permaculture, we have these kind of key concepts and tenets and these key kind of like hallmarks that if you walk into somebody's yard and you see these design elements, you're like, oh yeah, that person's in a permaculture. And so it's, it's a way for people to kind of like fly their permaculture flag, right? I did a video a while back on herb spirals. That is one of the big ones. Using swales in the garden, that is a big one. Uh, intense mulching with wood chips, that's another big one. And fruit tree guilds, absolutely a huge hallmark of I am a permaculture person. Now, when we look at permaculture design, most of us do not have access to huge amounts of land. And so a lot of the concepts and design elements in permaculture have to be scaled down for suburban and urban yards, right? And that's kind of how tree guilds came about. We don't have the space to design for an entire food forest, right? And we may not be able to put out 20 filbert trees and we may not be able to plant acres and acres and acres and apples um, or a diversity of, of fruit trees. And so guilds focus their attention and on implementing design elements around one tree. If you only have space for one tree in your garden, how can you still do permaculture? The guild is a solution for that. And I will say here, we typically think fruit tree guilds, but you can use nuts as well. It's just that most of us in urban and suburban yards don't have space for a very large nut tree, like a pecan or, you know, a chestnut, something like that. And so, although I do have a hazel, which is more almost like a shrub, it's a small tree, uh, I do have a hazel in my garden. I don't have any very large nut trees because I just don't have the space and neither do other gardeners with my size yards. And so these guild concepts are typically implemented around fruit trees. So a guild is taking one tree, which is your canopy tree. In the wild, it may not be a canopy tree. For example, I have pawpaw guilds and pawpaw is a, you know, a sub canopy layer tree in the wild. So you have your canopy tree and you are choosing support plants to put around it in a sort of, you know, sort of a, a circular representation around the tree. And that is your kind of key species and your design elements are meant to complement that one tree. And there are seven layers to a guild. And the idea in permaculture is that you would find a way to implement all of those elements. In permaculture, we talk about stacking functions. We talk about using the space in as many ways as you possibly can in order to increase your yield and increase your efficiency. And so you're looking at a small area around a tree and you're saying like, I don't have to have one tree and then just mulch. I can actually fit in six other layers of living things around this tree. So if your canopy layer, you have your sub canopy tree, which would be, you know, obviously like a smaller tree underneath it, much easier to implement a sub canopy tree if you have a large tree as your kind of center of your guild. And then you have your shrub layer, large shrubs. And then you end up having basically 
you know, a vining layer that I think this is the one that people drop most quickly and decide to forego in their design. Um, you have a vining layer that ideally would vine up through any of these other things here, your shrubs, your sub canopy, your canopy tree. So after vining layer, you have your herbaceous layer. In my garden, that often looks like rhubarb. It could look like comfrey. Those herbaceous perennials that are a little bit bigger. Um, and then you have your ground cover layer, which could be something like strawberries, um, basically low lying, could be annual or perennial ground covers, self-sowing annual or perennial ground covers. And then you have your rhizosphere, which, you know, also called the roots, root vegetable layer, where typically you would think about planting some kind of root crop. That's a whole other issue. Do you want to be planting and digging root crops around the base of all of these trees and other perennials? But it also kind of includes uh, the fungal life in the soil. And when people think about growing things like um, intentionally planting gourmet mushrooms like Strafaria rugosa annulata or um, morels or something like that, right? So those are your seven layers. And within those seven layers, they can all serve many different functions, right? So you're taking up as many layers, just like in a real forest, there are going to be many layers that are utilized. So you're getting maximum diversity within the space because you're using vertical layers and you're, you're nestling things in together that are different sizes. Each of those can have different roles. So we think of there being food producing plants in our guild. Obviously, our central canopy tree is going to be producing food, but the shrub layer and the herbaceous layer could be producing things. You could have berry bushes in your shrub layer. You can have, um, you know, like I said, rhubarb in your herbaceous layer. You could have lovage. You could have all kinds of food, food producing plants. You have insectiary plants that are meant to draw in beneficial insects and pollinators, right? Beneficial insects meaning, you know, like maybe a uh, parasitoid wasps or, um, you know, various other predators of pest insects that c might come into your guild and otherwise bother your, um, your food crops, right? So you have those kind of insectary plants and insectary slash pollinator attractor. We're also looking at bringing in birds as well. And maybe bats, depending on where your guild is, maybe you are in the desert and you want to attract, um, you want to attract bats. There you go. That's your layer for you. And then you have like medicinal herbs as well that you can stack in. Next, you have your nitrogen fixers. And these can be all sizes, right? So these various roles are not confined to specific layers. So you could have nitrogen fixing clover ground cover. You could have a large shrub in your garden, like a gumi berry or an autumn olive, any of those Eliagnus species. Those are going to fix nitrogen and provide extra nitrogen to your central tree. And then you're looking at dynamic accumulators. That's a whole other can of worms. Are dynamic accumulators a thing? The, the concept behind a dynamic accumulator is this belief that there are plants that can mine nutrients from deep in the soil and consolidate them in their leaves. And then if you um, use those leaves as mulch, then they will return those minerals and nutrients higher up, right, onto the surface layer of the soil. Um, or if you prune them back, then that causes root dieback, and therefore they release some of those good things into the soil. Dynamic accumulators and whether there is a lot of science to back them up are, you know, like a, t a topic for another video. But let's say it does no harm to consider planting things you think are dynamic accumulators, comfrey being the big one. So the idea here is that you're filling a small space with plants that, and fungi that support your central tree and help it be as healthy as possible. You're making sure there's nitrogen fixation. You are having plants that you grow and you can chop for mulch around your tree. You're having the addition of all of these other food crops you can grow. You're trying to bring in beneficial insects. You're trying to deter pests all in natural ways. It sounds really beautiful and lovely and idyllic. And I love guilds. I love them. I think they are a really beautiful way to illustrate the thought process and the way that permaculture people conceptualize the interplay between various elements of the garden. So I'm a big fan of them. Let's get back to this meme. Are they pseudoscience? Like, are they kind of like a bunch of, you know, woo? 
And, you know, if you've followed me for a while, you know that I'm a little bit of a crunchy hippie, right? Um, I love permaculture, so obviously I have to be a little bit of a crunchy hippie. I love science as well. I was a biology major and I come from a family of scientists and physicians. And I have always tried to, in my life, balance that kind of desire for that idyllic kind of earth mama aesthetic with evidence-based practice. And for me, a lot of permaculture um, can be a little bit of a struggle. So I've talked about herb spirals in the past because people see them as really necessary in permaculture. And they are really a way to illustrate the design principles. They're there to illustrate concepts. They're a teaching tool in permaculture. And I think fruit guilds are the same way. I don't think fruit guilds are a miracle. I don't think they mean you will have no pest and disease issues. I don't think that they are the only way to grow trees. In fact, I've had other permaculture people touring my yard and online who have criticized the parts of my garden where I have fruit trees and they are not planted in guilds. Specifically, in my orchard where my ducks and chickens are, where guilds won't work because my ducks especially will mow the herbaceous plants to the ground and my chickens will scratch up all of those delicate ground covers. Like guilds just don't work in that setting. So, so is there a lot of science to back up that guilds are the way to grow fruit trees? No, there's not. And I think a lot of things in permaculture are that way. Permaculture is a design system. I kind of push back against people who are like, it's a plant science. It's not a science. It's a design system and it borrows from a lot of traditional practices that folks have used for centuries because they see anecdotally that they work well or they are tied to cultural traditions that are important to people, right? Like there's no magic to the three sisters, um, you know, growing corn, beans, and squash, but it is a traditional practice that a lot of people value and they see benefit from. And I think guilds are that way as well. So there's no hard science that I found. And if you have found research where somebody has analyzed guilds and has said like, yes, these actually are the best way to grow fruit trees, please, please let me know in the comments because I'm always down to read the research. Definitely love to read the research, love to nerd out over it. But, you know, I think it's almost impossible to, to really study guilds and, and get a great assessment of, of how they stand up to agri other agricultural methods in kind of a, a quantifiable way. And that's because there's no right or wrong way to do a guild. Okay, editing Angela here. If you go on Google Scholar, you go on JSTOR, some other search engine, EBSCO, you'll find that there are not a lot of scholarly articles on this that quantify the impact of designing with a fruit guild. There's a lot about conceptualization and about the system of designing a guild. There's not a lot about the efficacy behind it. So one of the most common questions I get about how to design your guilds is what plants do I plant around X type of tree? Angela, please tell me what kind of plants do I plant around a peach tree to make the guild? What plants do I plant around an apple to make my guild correct? What plants do I plant around my filbert? And this is where guilds are, are a teaching tool. They are a great way to demonstrate that you understand the connectedness in permaculture and you are thinking consciously about the way that two plants planted near each other might interact. But there is no set list of plants that you should plant around specific types of fruit trees especially because we're growing fruit trees in all kinds of different climates and we're growing different varieties and we have different needs as gardeners and we have different pests and we have different, you know, support plants that we benefit from and that the garden ecosystem would benefit from depending on where we live and who we are. So I've seen folks, often folks who are new to permaculture can be really rigid in the way that they conceptualize guilds. Like give me a list of plants. And if you go on Pinterest or, you know, you look in some permaculture books, people are like, this is what you should plant around your peach tree. But there is no right or wrong. Whether I choose to plant hostas or French sorrel around my peach tree, like either of those might work. And it's really, what do you enjoy eating? What are the plants that you enjoy seeing? And for me, so much of guild design is about the visual appeal. Yeah, I'm trying to incorporate all of those layers. I may not get them all right. And I'm not gonna be dogmatic about it because it's not a fine tuned science, it's an art. And so much of what I think is important about permaculture 
is getting us to think about the connections that are happening in the garden and how we are connected in the garden. So if I am designing around a tree in a way that looks lush and beautiful and diverse, and I'm thinking about the colors and shapes of the plants and how they interact, how the different color of the foliage and the different shapes of the foliage play against each other and move in the breeze. To me, that's almost as important as whether I am strictly getting a dynamic accumulator here and the right kind of nitrogen fixer here. Because if my garden is beautiful and I'm paying attention to the way that things look together and interact together in an aesthetic way, I'm much more likely to be out in the garden and like, and then I'll notice pests and diseases before they take root, when they're just getting their toe in the door, right? I will notice what pollinators are visiting my garden. I will have a more connected relationship with my garden. So for me, growing those, you know, guild arrangements is as much about the enjoyment that I get out of it and the way that I am appreciating the garden as it is between the strict roles of all of those different layers. And I don't think that reduces the value of guilds at all, that there's no real specific data being like, this is what you need to have in your garden in order to do it right. And if you see folks in permaculture who are being dogmatic and telling you what you should plant around various trees, or you're seeing folks who say, you really need a guild around that. Mm, they're not taking into account the fact that in permaculture, we have site specific design and the site includes you, the gardener and the needs of the garden. And so everybody's plantings are going to look different. It's about designing what is right for your site rather than sticking to rigid rules. So I will say, just like those herb spirals, guilds are an important teaching tool for people that are new to permaculture to start thinking about about how to do permaculture, starting to think with a permaculture lens and really dive into the relationships. And I think people can go very far down the rabbit hole of like fleshing out all of the niche connections that your tree could have with the various layers in your guild. And I think that can lend itself to a little bit of legalistic thinking. It can le lend itself to kind of hyper-focusing on getting the right plant, but there's so much freedom to mess around with different plants and see um, and experience and assess the interplay between those plants and not worry about having to pick the perfect plant to go under your fruit trees. More using those guild layers, those seven layers and those different roles that plants can have within your guild as a way to begin to think like a permaculturist and as a way to guide you in your design, right? And so whether or not there is strict science behind it, I think is totally irrelevant. As long as we're not religiously adhering to guilds as the end all and be all, and as long as our expectations are realistic about what a guild can give us, it's not a magical set of rules. It's not the key to a perfect pest and disease free garden. It is not the only way to grow fruit trees in permaculture or any other method of sustainable agriculture, but it is a really handy guide that can help shape the way that we think. It can help shape the way that we interact with the garden. It can improve the aesthetics, the productivity, and you know, the quality of our garden on many levels. For me, I love the look of like a June garden with everything green and lush and beginning to bloom around a fruit tree guild. I think that that is one of the most beautiful sites because it echoes what we see in nature. Those layers in a fruit tree guild are observed layers of plants growing in the wild. And so we're seeing this designing from patterns to details. We're seeing this utilization of permaculture principles where we are taking elements from nature. And we are saying these work well. Mother Nature did a good job. Evolution did a good job. Let's harness some of those in our own garden and see if we get some of the same benefits. Not the promise of we will get those benefits, not the promise of like, this is recapturing Eden, but this is going to make a really beautiful garden for you. And it's going to get you to value diversity in the garden. It's going to see an increase in yield to various fruit crops because in the space where you otherwise would grow one fruit tree, you're now growing a fruit tree and you're growing aronia berries and you're growing gumi berries and you're growing four different kinds of herbs and you have ground cover strawberries and you're growing, you know, wine cap mushrooms and you're bringing in all of these beneficial creatures to your garden that 
produce a yield for you of enjoyment as well as your main crop of apples or what have you. And so in that respect, um, as hilarious as the meme was, and as much as I, as a science loving person, want us to follow the data, me as a permaculturist says, sometimes there isn't data and sometimes the artistry is just as important as the science. And the artistry is an element that we can't forgo in the rigid pursuit of like, we can't do something unless there's a, a, you know, a bunch of peer reviewed data out there to back up our practice. Sometimes using what is ancestral knowledge, using what is traditional practice, using what is artistry and design and is something that we gain a lot of enjoyment out of is enough. That's enough until we have the data to back it up. And one of the things that I think I have noticed over 15 years in the garden I'm in now using guilds extensively is that it does no harm. I have not seen any harm from my garden and I have seen myself wanting to connect more with my garden, thinking much more intentionally about the plants that I'm planting and seeing an increase in yields in my garden as a result. Um, so for me, I've seen benefits anecdotally and I've seen that no harm has been done. So I hope that answers that question. Like are guilds worth planting and pursuing? Absolutely. Are they something that we need to be rigid about in permaculture? Absolutely not. Are they something that works everywhere? No. Are they something that could be a real benefit to you? And could be a way to help teach you more about permaculture and teach you more about the ways that different elements of our our garden design interact with each other. Yes, absolutely. And so as a teaching tool, as an aesthetic design element in the garden, and as a way to increase the yield in a small space of various food and medicinal crops, I think guilds are a wonderful design. I think they are something I wish there was more research about. If I could go back and get my PhD, perhaps I would study the efficacy of guilds as a design element because I think that it would be really fascinating to see like what are the quantifiable differences? What are the tangible calculable benefits of using guilds. Again, if that research is out there, please link it below because I would love, 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 love to read about it. You know, I think permaculture has gotten a lot of backlash lately. Uh, rightly so. I've talked about perma bros. I've talked about gurus in permaculture. I've talked about people wanting to use permaculture to do a capitalism. I've talked about the problems of colonialism and patriarchy within permaculture. There's still so much beneficial about permaculture that I don't want us to throw the baby out with the bathwater just because some folks are trying to co-opt it for their prepper or right-wing agenda or because some folks are using it as their get-rich-quick scheme, which is laughable actually. There are so many beneficial elements in permaculture, even if there is an element of artistry that seems to supersede the science sometimes. I think there's so much good here that we can learn and so much that will benefit us in the garden and other elements, other aspects of our life as well. So I hope you will stay and explore some of my other videos about permaculture. I hope that you'll share your thoughts or experiences down below about fruit guilds and how they have or have not worked for you. If supporting this channel through Patreon or the thanks button below is is not for you, one of the best things you can do is to click like and subscribe. You can also share my videos, share my content. That's hugely, hugely helpful for me in continuing to be able to make content for you all. So thanks so much for watching today. Uh, I hope that you are staying well and safe. I hope that you are enjoying these last couple of days of winter as we are almost about ready to launch into spring. I know I'm getting really excited about the garden. Um, I spent most of the weekend outdoors doing yard work, clean up and prep, uh, pruned pruned my roses. I didn't get too damaged. This is this is why you wear rose gloves instead of regular gloves because rose gloves go up to here, but I didn't. Um, I will be back really soon with another video. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.